Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us dealing with a loved one with memory loss. Hey listeners, before we get into today's show, I've got an exciting little offer for you. Hop on over to the website, it's in the show notes, scroll down to the bottom and there's a little offer for you. I think you're going to love it and now let's get into our show. With me today is Matt Peel. He is the sales director and founder at Movement Academy. They are in the business to help seniors and youth improve athletic and cognitive performance. So good afternoon, Matt. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself first. Well, I have been in the uh, overall health and fitness industry since 2008. That's when I first became a personal trainer at uh, 24 Hour Fitness in Laguna Hills, California, and uh, always had an interest in health and fitness. And decided, well, let's uh, life kind of changes directions and gives you an opportunity to go after passion. So I took a risk and uh, got involved in it, and I've been training since then. I've had a number of training certifications from National Academy of Sports Medicine and. American Council on Exercising, and through that journey, it's uh, brought me back to uh, the New Orleans, Louisiana area, and I'm a co-founder in a company called Movement Academy that, as you said on LinkedIn, works with seniors to use exercise to promote cognitive function, uh, injury prevention, and help improve their quality of life, as well as helping youth uh, with a similar um, mission of building their cognitive functions functions through exercise and uh, agility coordination and physical physical education and activity. And so part of the education process is also nutrition, Mm -hmm. correct? Absolutely. If uh, you're not eating right, it really doesn't matter what you do for exercise. You're not going to get to where you want to be. Yeah, I learned that about, let's see, this is so, oh my goodness, almost eight years ago. I went on a, um, a lifestyle change to lose a considerable amount of weight, and they, they say you cannot exercise off a bad diet, and that unfortunately is true. You are correct about that. I did a uh, bodybuilding contest in 2013, and you know, never overweight or anything like that, but that really taught me how to use nutrition to you, you got to be strict you know on that in that kind of level but how important it is when changing your body composition so unfortunately there's no magic wand no magic pill it comes down to really diet and nutrition things they've been telling us this telling us for what a hundred years at least <laughs> at least at least well, I haven't been around quite that long. I do have a grandmother <laughs> who turned 100 uh, about f- five weeks ago already. Wow, so, congratulations. Yeah, exciting. I can't imagine living that long, but I probably will. Um, well, good for you. My maternal grandmother lived to 91, even though she had, um, I think she had undiagnosed Alzheimer's. She definitely had memory loss and all of the dementias and all the stuff that comes with that. So as I tell my friends, I'm only at the very beginning of stage two of my life. You're stuck with me for many more years. That's a good problem to have. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what we should be doing with our food and what we shouldn't be doing. I know, for example, we talked the other day, my mom was a heavy duty diet soda drinker all her life. And I, I can't do soda anymore. I haven't done soda for a very long time. And I, I can't imagine all the phosphorus bubbles and all that chemicals or did any favors for her. So maybe we can start there. No, soft drinks do not. It's kind of um, odd. You know, what do you put on your car battery to take the uh, corrosion off? You know what they say. That's true. I've heard that. I've not ever poured any Diet Coke on my car battery. It's it's. I don't know if it's the diet or the regular. Diet is actually worse for you than regular. But uh, yeah, stick it on there, and you'll see that acid just um, the corrosion go away. 
the hmm. uh, something in the, the Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola, whatever cola you want to put in your body, does it. So what does that do for you? does a lot of that to your insides. So it's not healthy for you. The biggest thing really without getting down and dirty with the specific ingredients is it's excess calories. It's mm-hmm. excess sugars. And those are things that people don't think about on a daily basis, but it's a massive contributor to waking. You know, you have a, a glass of Coke or a glass and a half at uh, lunch and maybe one in the afternoon, then maybe another few at dinner. And at around 110, gallery, 110 calories per serving, add that up. Well, she always, next... dr- she always drank diet, which uh-huh. is definitely not much. I mean, it's calorie-wise is not as horrible, but just more chemicals. The other stuff inside it, yeah, more chemicals. More chemicals actually promotes weight gain. Yeah, she doesn't have that problem. I, I inherited the fat gene on my dad's side of the family, so I'm hoping I didn't get the Alzheimer's gene from mom's side of the family because that would just be yeah. unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Double whammy. Yeah, that's as my uh, now 100-year-old grandmother said several years ago, I was teasing her and said, you know, I got the fat gene from your side of the family. I better not get the Alzheimer's gene from mom's side of the family. And she looked at me and said, well, if you do, you won't remember. Well, true. That's a good way to think about it. That is true. But <laughs> hopefully you don't. Yeah, so yeah soft, soft drinks are definitely not good. You replace that with water. And if you need to add some flavor because people say, oh, I get tired of the taste of water. Well, you know, throw some lemon in there, throw some lime, throw a little bit of orange in there. It's fine, but you you need water. Water is what hydrates. Soft drinks dehydrate you. They're diuretics. I believe it. So I'm sure you're familiar with the Mediterranean diet, yes? I am. Um, Are you familiar with the DASH diet? No, just the Dine and Dash diet. Dine and Dash diet. I don't don't recommend that either. No, we could get your exercise for the dashing. You do. Uh, You do. So the DASH diet... I had it pulled up here, and now I can't find it. It's to it's to decrease uh, hypertension. Okay. And then so reduction in sodium and salt. Exactly. Like that. It is. So then there there is a new version called the Mind Diet. It's a combination of the two, and it focuses on vegetables, leafy green veggies, berries, especially blueberries. Nuts, beans, wine, whole grains, fish, poultry, and olive oil. Okay, good stuff. So other than, well, there's two things. I don't drink wine. It gives me really bad heartburn. I I stick to tea and water. And I don't like fish at all. I have tried every incantation, every chef that's cooked it super well. I just can't deal with it. So do you have suggestions for people like me that just just can't? Well, if you don't want to eat fish, it's fine. One of the important parts of fish is the fattiness of, of the fish, the good fat. So if you can't stomach the actual taste in the fish, take a fish oil supplement. I do that. Um, and get your protein from another source, which is fine, which can be plant-based. Or still lean proteins such as poultry, uh, you know, various cuts of pork and um, and beef. Although it is still preferred to stay more on the the, the poultry side than let's uh, say going a lot of red meat. But red meat is fine again in moderation. And I think that's the whole thing in general is to be moderate with your diet and not necessarily go ext- to extremes. You know, when we talk about um, diet as a overall noun um that is what is our food composed of but when people are talking about dietine then that has a nasty connotation as a verb because in that regards uh diet means die and deprivation (laughs) and there's a starting point and there's an ending point so when you get to that ending point people go okay well i followed this 12 week 8 week 10 week whatever week diet that my latest book that i bought that uh, Susie Homemaker referred me to, but it doesn't really teach what can I do for the rest of my life. 
Yes, I went I went on my nutritional changing journey. A lot of people were like, "Oh, I don't know how you do that." I went um I I actually buck the the normal trend, which is typical for me and the only way that I have actually been able to lose weight and keep it off is to go very very low fat. Mhm. Which they say, "Oh, no, no, it's, you know, that's that's not necessary." Well, yeah. Tell that to my genetics because I've been trying to lose some about 15 pounds that I gained while dealing with my father dying and all the craziness with my mom. And it's not coming off. And I know what I need to do, but it doesn't fit into my schedule right now. So it's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so so let, let's let's talk a little bit about macronutrients because okay. that's everything is composed – uh, one of uh, one or a combination of the three macronutrients, which are proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. There is n- nothing out there aside from water, which is water, that does not have those ingredients in it. So, what? How many cal- a calorie? I mean, I'm sorry, one gram of protein and one gram of carbohydrates each has four calories per gram. A gram of Alcohol has seven calories, and a gram of fat has nine calories. So if you were to track your food on a daily basis and do that math, you can see how a typical uh, Western American diet, uh, which is higher in fat, all of a sudden adds up in calories because one gram of fat is nine calories. So if you're having your McDonald's, or your typical fast food or something fried, there's a lot of fat in there. So now your calorie count is way high. And people don't realize that. They say, well, that's all right, just fats. Well, even though it's a healthy fat and an unhealthy fat, there are differences. But as far as calories, it's exactly the same. It's still nine calories per gram. So, so I think that's an important factor that people should know about. And also when understanding what a carbohydrate is. Uh, I hear it often, people, oh, I have, uh, I just have uh, lots of fruit today. I did pretty much just eat, eat only fruit. So I'm, I'm fine. That, that's not carbohydrates. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's good carbohydrates, but maybe not. It is good carbohydrates, not, right? It's better than processed. Milk. That's true. But it, a fruit is still a carbohydrate. A vegetable, oh, I just have vegetables. I don't I don't eat carbs. A vegetable is a carbohydrate. Now, beans and legumes are also plant-based sources of protein, but they're also carbohydrates. So I'd never tell people to get rid of carbohydrates, uh, neither would a doctor, because carbohydrates are what the body prefers to use for energy. But can we moderate them? Absolutely. And just be honest with yourself when you're having it and you say, oh, I just have lots of fruit, lots of fruit, lots of fruit. Well, great. That's fine. But again, that's that's a lot of calories still uh, adding up in there. And you're not exactly cutting back on carbs when you're having four or five apples and a few bananas a day. And certain fruits have a lot more natural sugar, which doesn't always help either. Correct. Correct. So it's always good to do a food diary. That's why I suggest for everybody, uh, especially if you do have some type of disease uh, like Alzheimer's and, you know, obviously have someone help you in, in that kind of uh, condition. But it's good to write down a food diary and track and you can do the math yourself. You don't need to be a doctor. You don't need to be a trainer or a dietitian to do simple math, even though we say math is hard. But it, it really is eye-opening when you just track what you're doing. That is true. I used to do that. That's probably what I need to get back to. That might help. The planning and the counting and getting everything so it fit within the nutrition plan the trainer gave me takes a lot more time than I have right now. It does, but there's ways to start on that. For people that they think, oh, I don't have time to research it, great. Don't research it. Just write everything down that you stick in your mouth. Don't worry about what it is as far as your serving size Just becoming that aware when you write down uh, two glasses of soft drink, um, two cookies, uh, you know, a big serving of 
uh, meatloaf and maybe a couple tablespoons of uh, potatoes and something else. If so, if you when you just see that, it makes you think about, hmm, that probably wasn't too good. And that awareness will often lead to a positive change without even getting drilling down to the actual numbers of it. Well, that would probably be an excellent place for somebody who is needing to change their diet but maybe reluctant. Yes. Yes. Just doing that. Remember, you're, you're not lying to your trainer. You're just lying to yourself. That is true. Because my father was extremely picky. And that... I'm sure it didn't help him because he ended up diabetic and it didn't obviously help my mother either. Mm-hmm. So my household, we eat, we eat really healthy. Try to, we actually make our own bread and nice. grow. I got seedlings started for all kinds of summer veggies. Cool. I keep them away from the ground squirrels. That'll be good. <laughs> right. That, that, that's another topic for another day. Yeah. That, that's a whole other problem. Um, what else do we do? Oh, the most of the meat that we get is hormone-free mm-hmm. and organic. So I'm not sure I can do any better other than obviously I need to cut back a little bit on the fat and the calories, which is saying the same thing right there. <laughs> saying the same thing. You're, you're right. And I, I don't like to be a hypocrite, and I'm not a hypocrite, and I never tell someone you have to stop drinking. Hey, I enjoy, I enjoy alcohol as much as the next person. But and for moderation and lifestyle, I, my suggestions to people, just save it for the weekend. Save it for Friday and Saturday. You don't need a glass of wine or, or a beer or whatever during the week. You really don't. Have, have water with it. Just those little substitutions, water for typical maybe a soft drink or alcohol drink during the week, will make a drastic change in somebody's life. I know a lot of people that could start there. Yep. I'm absolutely a sugar fiend. I had to learn how to to control that and find different things that were that almost satisfy the sweet tooth. And I have mm-hmm. read that there are some studies that think they actually call Alzheimer's like type three diabetes because they think that uncontrolled uh, blood sugar can lead to brain damage, like Alzheimer's mm-hmm. dementia. Mm-hmm. So fortunately, I because of the diabetes on my dad's side of the family, I learned I learned how to control that sweet tooth as much as possible. It's it's never going to go away. You know, I know a lot of nutritionists say, well, just just give it up cold turkey, and after a week, you know, you won't you won't crave it anymore. And my family looks on with horror when they hear that because they know for me that I would be in jail after a week because I'd kill somebody. <laughs> Right, right, and then that's why again, it, it's it's all about moderation. We, I, hey, I enjoy a sweet every now and then. As a matter of fact, truth be told, when I walked in the hotel here, uh, as I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, this evening, I picked up a cookie and had a cookie. You know, hey, I'm a human, but when you moderate most of your, you know, the rest of your life, having a cookie doesn't kill you on a on a Wednesday afternoon when the rest of your day is mostly good or the rest of your week is mostly good. A cookie doesn't hurt. If you're really just angst and Let's take a quick break and, and hear a message night, from like, our really presenting sponsor. Sponsors allow wine. us to bring you this one podcast free of charge you. every week. Something it's we absolutely the love constant, to do. MBK every Senior night, Community is dedicated to being the preferred senior true. living provider in the markets they serve. They create warm, inviting living spaces in desirable locations. They offer a variety of services and programs to enrich the lives of residents and their families. And by getting to know their residents, their personal preferences, and their individual needs, MBK Senior Communities can better contribute to their well-being and provide care that's right for them. They are committed to enhancing independence and quality of life, serving others the way they prefer to be treated, and providing care that is delivered with integrity, dignity, and compassion. Currently serving the Western United States, but expanding. Why not contact your local community for a tour and see for yourself why most of their residents say they felt at home from their very first visit? You can get more information by visiting their website at mbk 
SeniorLiving.com or call 949-242-1400. I have a funny story to tell about a cookie. Uh, in the middle of the journey, I lost 100 pounds. So it was, a, wow. it was a, quite a long journey. It took about two years. Mm-hmm. There was one morning I woke up and went, I think I just had a food porn dream about a chocolate chip cookie. And I think I even put it out on Facebook or something because another, a past client of mine who's also a trainer and a Pilates instructor, she's like, for the love of God, just eat the cookie. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to. Don't worry about it. But it was the (laughs) funniest thing because it was like I woke up and I could taste it and smell it and see it. And it was like, wow, I have never had that vivid a dream about food. And I like food. (laughs) Right. Hey, I do too. I live in New Orleans. We love food in New Orleans. Well, I live um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, so we have a lot of options. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with food. Don't be afraid of food. It's just, uh, again, choices. Making better choices throughout. And sometimes people are on the road and it's hard to make choices, but you just make the best of what's out there. But the biggest thing, though, is at the grocery store, and this is where I really hammer on to my clients, is, you know, it's, it's your hand that reaches out and then picks up that box of sugary cereal or those cookies or that whatever it is and puts it in the buggy. No, it's not, oh, God, that kids have to have it. The kids don't have to have it because you're going to end up eating it. And then it's it's your hand that reaches into your purse or your back pocket and your wallet and pulls out your debit card or your hard-end cash and pays at the grocery store. So if you're not doing that, it can't be at your house. And you can't eat it because now you're going to have to leave the house, which makes you really think twice about it. Do I really want that? Do I really need to go somewhs just for that little small cookie or for that just one beer? <laughs> no, nah, I probably don't. So do you have any suggestions? Like, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, my dad was super picky. And mm-hmm. I know when he was diagnosed with diabetes, my mom said... She handed him a diabetic cookbook and said, pick out meals that you think you would like and I will make them for you. And he thumbed through it rapidly and handed it back to her and said, I'm going to eat what I want and die happy, which did not happen. Without going into details, that didn't happen. So I know when I went on my weight loss journey, my trainer said, you know, cut back here, cut back there, but don't do everything at once. Make one change this week and a second change next week. You know, and in a few weeks, your nutrition will probably be significantly cleaned up. And I, that's what I tell people. Like, don't go home and throw out all the sugar and the beers and the, the tortilla chips and all that stuff. One, it's a huge waste, and you might end up buying it again anyway. Make make slow changes so that they last because whatever you're doing now to lose weight or to be feel better or for brain health or diabetes or whatever your excuse is you have to do this for the rest of your life I may have close to 50 more years so I've learned how to bake differently and Mm -hmm. eat differently and I can't go back I can't just I you know there was I have one other question I was going to ask you but how would you help people make that change if they're just that reluctant i think you have to go deeper to it and get a little bit more philosophical with it and figure out and and i know it's been said many many times of of knowing your why like why are you doing this because if if you don't have a strong enough why then it's not going to work whatever whatever your challenge may be um there is a substitute for everything out there but you got to get in touch with truly why you're going to do it. And with, for some people, you, you make a change for inspiration or desperation. And there are there are a handful out there that just don't give a damn. Say, I really don't care if I'm going to die. I'm going to die anyways or how I do it, so I'm going to continue on this. Well, okay, so that, that small percent of the population is, is, is done, is gone. You can't help them. But for the rest, like you said, it is, and your other trainer said, it is a small change. So if you're a, if you're a six-pack-a-day Coke drinker, we'll just kind of stay on that example, 
replace one of those Cokes with a glass of water this week. Next week, maybe try two Cokes replaced with a glass of water. And you're right, it's those small changes that begin to make that make the big changes because you didn't put on 100 pounds overnight, right? No. Nope. It took a while, and it didn't come off overnight. It nope. takes a while. <laughs> so I think that's also where the, the instant gratification of America and human beings come, and that's why people uh, sign up on January 1st for the gym and they're done by January uh, 3rd. It doesn't happen. You, you have to be small daily changes to make something large at the end of your time period. Now you said you're on the road and mm -hmm. I know one of my biggest challenges is I cannot eat in restaurants three times right. a day. Right. So when we travel, we try to do Airbnb so that we ha or a timeshare so we have a kitchenette and mm -hmm. make some of our own foods. I mean it saves you money. It's it's, yes. it's a ben yes. benefit across the board. But when you're traveling, what do you suggest for people? Because I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going on a cruise. Hopefully I won't come back 10 pounds heavier. And I'm thinking, God, no. You know, I, I want to, first off, if I if I even ate that way, that I, that I would put on weight, it makes me actually nauseous. Right. So there was a study done that I read. And the actual, we'll talk about that for an example, but when they talk about holiday weight, because that's kind of a, a similar to it, going on a cruise for a week or what have you, you feel like, oh my God, I put on like five or six or eight, 10 pounds. Honestly, the research has shown that you uh, have only put on maybe about one to one to one to two pounds, if that. So our brains go haywire, but the reality is of it, you haven't put that much weight on. Because that's a lot of, 10 pounds is a lot of calories. Right, right. And a lot of laying around and just basically opening your mouth and shoveling food in it constantly. Yeah, I'm not so, into that either. No. So if you're on vacation and you, you, you've you been good and training for it, you know, enjoy your vacation. Stay active. Stay active. That's a good way to help combat something like that is just be active throughout it. You're going to be in a new place. You're going to want to try something new. You're going to enjoy a little bit more alcohol. You're going to enjoy some desserts or foods. Um, and that's great. That's why you're on vacation. So one, again, one week or four days doesn't kill you. So when you get back home, that your entire lifestyle is ruined. It's just a vacation. G give yourself a mental break off of that and go, okay, now I'm back, back into my normal routine. And I think some people just take that as an excuse because, again, their why isn't strong enough to have themselves disciplined and dedicated. So they're looking for that way to get off the hook. And they use it. That makes sense. So do you have any suggestions for those people who want to do, you know, they want to stay somewhat on track, eat healthy, mm -hmm. but they're traveling or, you know, driving around, um, just whatever. I have a neighbor that's a salesman, so he does a lot of driving. I used to have a friend who dinner was always the nearest drive through which made me want to bang my head on the wall. And that was before I went on the weight loss and lifestyle change journey. Right. So it's tough, especially if you're, um, if you're flying, uh, because you don't have access maybe to a vehicle to go to uh, the nearest grocery store. And even going downstairs in the hotel lobby and you want to just get a snack of something, they're, they're typically not healthy. So how do you mitigate it is try and, and pack ahead of time, just like you do your clothes. Um, try to pack a, a better type of protein bar. Uh, typically, hotels are going to have some type of breakfast, a free breakfast. So maybe you can pick up some fruit or get one of the Greek yogurts from down there and put it in your room. That's another great snack to have in your room, and it's free with your room cost. Um, when you're out on the road traveling, again, just try and stay away from fried. There are other options out there. Uh, it's not like you have to go overboard and have only Subway every single day because <laughs> uh, that's what some people think they need to do. And then they get the foot long loaded with everything, and, oh, my God, now that's 900 calories. Right. It's a lot. 
So how can you mitigate that even with a subway? One good way to do that is to get a six inch and double meat. I've done that. that. Ups, yeah, that ups your protein, keep your carbohydrates uh, regulated a little bit better. Um, just go for grilled, grilled and boiled options whenever you're out instead of fried. Uh, if you are, do you have to have a hamburger? Something when I do, I'll just take one of the buns. I'll take the top bun off and throw it away. And just at least have the bottom bun, and that takes away some calories and carbohydrates right there. That's true. That's a good choice. So it's, it's little options like that, and people think, oh, well, I didn't think about that before. But when you add it up again at the end of the day and the end of the week, you know, that half a bun, uh, you know, that could take away 40 calories right there just on half a bun. You so fancy, do that. Fancy hamburger places is probably closer to 200 Maybe. Pretzel buns, and some of them are so big. Right. So you can also ask for it um, open face. And again, just eat half the bun, which is which is fine. Well, I have a suggestion, too. I don't know if in New Orleans you guys have the line bikes, the bike rentals. Oh, yeah, they just got those last year. Well, we went to spring training in Arizona, and as we drove in, the Lyft driver was driving us to the hotel. He was pointing out all the bikes everywhere. And mm-hmm. that's what we did to get from the hotel to the restaurants and the games. And my husband and I are cyclists. So that was, it was great because I'm more into cycling than baseball. So I enjoyed being able to pedal around to get wherever we were going. Now it's flat and those were either one or three speed bikes. So there was no wasn't a lot of calorie burn with them, but, you know. It's it's overall activity, and everything you do does burn calories. So the more walking you can do, bike riding that you can do in an area, typical uh, metropolitan areas, you can walk. You don't have to Uber everywhere. You don't have to Uber two blocks. No. You know, you know get out there and, and use your feet and walk two or three blocks. It's, it's fine. That's how you – actually, that's how you experience more of the culture of its town – is that you're walking by and that's when you notice the small local places and you can uh, enjoy whether it is a restaurant or just a you know a place to, to buy art or, or trinkets. But get out there and, and walk more than, than Uber. That's a good point. We're going to Toronto in June. My husband and I are also Rotarians, so we're going to the International Convention. Mm-hmm. We have a an Airbnb with a kitchen right. and we're right in the heart of downtown. And I have to check. I don't know if Lime Bike is, I think they're in Toronto. I have to check. But that's our plan so far for staying healthy while we're there. And there's a lot of walking. We went to the International Convention in Atlanta. And the first day, we walked like nine miles. And the next day, I needed a different pair of shoes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You don't necessarily want to do it in Atlanta in July. We uh, we were there in June. Oh. Um, and we were lucky because we got there and it was, it was hot, but the humidity was in the mid fifties to 60% instead of like, that's dry. That's dry for us over here in the South. Yeah. Well, compared to here where, you know, 50, 60% is what we get when it's raining. Right. (laughs) It still felt humid, but I could tell that it wasn't hot Atlanta like I'd heard because everybody kept saying, why are you going to Atlanta in June? Are you crazy? And I'm like, well. I've never been, and that's when the convention is, so yes, that's when we're going. I think Toronto will be better. I I guarantee that. So what's the best month to go to New Orleans? Uh, Really, the spring is pretty nice. Um, February, March, April is nice. Uh, Let's see, the fall... Every fall is different. It could be gorgeous in November. It could still be... 88 degrees in November, but I would definitely say the springtime is the best, especially with all the festivals that we have going on. Sounds good. So now there was one article I just read recently. I think it was between our phone conversation and today. They were talking about the problem of muscle loss Mm -hmm. actually enhancing is the wrong word, but how muscle loss actually can also contribute to cognitive issues. And there was a very technical article, so it's it's difficult to um, sum up. Uh, I know that your brain is a muscle, 
and I know, and I learned this, this is what got me into weight training. You, the more lean muscle you have, the more calories you burn when you're sitting on your butt. That's the only reason I got into weight training. But do you have any um, insight into, you know, maintaining muscle and brain health? Well, muscle mass uh, is related also to your protein intake and making sure you have enough protein for protein synthesis to rebuild and recover, which also um, relates to your sleep, which also then relates to uh, healthy brain. Um, what does feed the brain are fats. Healthy fats are what the brain uh, enjoys using. So that's why fish oil is great for keeping your, your brain health and things like avocados and, and, and nuts. Those are great foods for brain health. Um, again, we just don't need to go overboard on it, moderation, but healthy fats are great for your brain. And, and then you can actually, what exercise can do in conjunction with your, your diet is you can still build brain cells in your hippocampus throughout your entire life. And when say, oh, I can't get any smarter. Well, you know, you, you, you can because you can continue to build brain cells and, and having and um, help out with the blood vessels also in your brain. And there's plenty of research on out there to substantiate um, that fact. So good heart health leads to good brain health because it also it revolves around your blood circulation. And as long as you have good circulation, then your brain and your heart uh, can talk to each other better, and they function better as a unit. It makes sense. Just off the top of my head, and this might, might be more of a medical question, so if you can't answer it, it's fine, but this question popped into my head. Can you have low blood pressure and not have good, like, overall blood flow? That would have to be a question for a, a doctor. Okay. Yeah, I can't really comment on that. Because my maternal side of the family, where all the Alzheimer's is, has also pretty much all had low blood pressure. So mm -hmm. it's interesting. That's why I was thinking. Like, I know my mom's nutrition was not great. Um, my maternal grandfather meals were not complete until he had dessert. So he had dessert twice a day. I don't know if he had dessert after breakfast. <laughs> uh I did have a trainer tell me that she tries to eat her sweets after breakfast or with breakfast because then you have all day to burn off the sugar, which was an excellent suggestion. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious. I'll have to find a doctor to ask that question too. Yeah, but it is true. If, if you're, you have your, have your larger meals earlier in the day and taper them down because it is correct. You, you have the day to burn what you're eating whether instead of vice versa, if you start small and finish off with a huge meal and dessert, then your physical activity is winding down and you don't have the opportunity to use those calories. So what is fat? Fat is just stored energy. You know, the energy can either be created or destroyed. It just changes forms. And so that's all it does. We just store it as adipose tissue in our body, which is fat. Yeah, and it doesn't like to burn that fat. So how do you burn that fat? This is the bodybuilding secret is that's where the ketosis thing uh, comes into play. And when they say um, the paleo diet, which is just really meat and veggies or fruit. So when you go on something like that and you up your protein intake and really drop your carbs, what that does is it forces the body to use your existing fat for fuel. Hmm. Okay. And that's that's the whole principle behind it without getting detailed into how many grams you need and how many calories you need. That's what happens to the body. When you up your protein, drop your carbohydrate intake, it is forcing the body to use your existing fat stores for energy. I'm not sure I ever heard that. I might have. It's been a few years. It was um, August of 2010 when I started mm -hmm. on that journey. So it's been a lot of years now, actually. That's frightening how fast those have gone by. But I'll remember that because I think that might be one of my issues as well. So is there any other pearls of wisdom you can give us for what we should do, what we should be putting in our mouths to help keep our brains healthy? It is just watching overall calories, your, your overall calorie intake, um, 
your fat intake, again, we say the healthy fats are good for your brain. Your brain does like fat, but moderation. Moderation is really the key to everything that's out there. Uh, no one ever suggests, unless you are so far in one extreme of obesity and overweight, that you have to go on to a medically supervised calorie-restricted diet. It is moderation. So less processed foods, less soft drinks, less alcohol, more shopping on the outside of the grocery store. That that's really what comes into play. Yes, it's more expensive, and yes, you run out of it more, but where do you want it to go to waste? Do you want it to go to your waste, or do you want it to go in the trash can waste? You know, that that's what you got to think about. That's a good way I'd of thinking have, about it. I'd rather have it go in the trash can waste than around my waste line. So shop around the outside of the grocery store, Keep things colorful on your plate because all the colors have different vitamins and minerals, which are all good for you. And make sure that you keep your serving sizes. Again, that the old kind of standby of the fist, of your fist, not Shaquille O'Neal's fist, <laughs> as I tell my clients. Right? Darn. Y- yes, your fist. That's that's kind of just a good rule of thumb. Well, that makes sense. And I think with that, that's probably plenty of information for people to absorb about food. We all resist all of that logical information, but it works. I can guarantee you I feel better now at 51 than I did at 31. And I know it's the exercise, and I I eat a lot better. And I I ate pretty good before, but I eat a lot better nowadays. Um, Good. So if uh, just... I'll give my quick self plug here at the end. So Certainly. if anybody wants to reach out to me and contact me, you can email me at M Peel. That's M P E A L E at movementacademy.net. And I will be more than happy to uh, answer any questions that I can uh, that are within my realm regarding exercise, nutrition, uh, even youth exercise and, and senior exercise. Awesome. Well, I very much appreciate it, and I hope you enjoy Memphis. Thank you. Thank you. Some scientists think that the food choices we make daily might lower our odds of getting Alzheimer's disease. Research has found that people who stick to a diet that includes foods like berries, leafy greens, and fish had a major drop in their risk for the memory sapping disorder, which affects more than 5 million Americans over the age of 65. The eating plan they recommend is called the MIND diet, and here's generally how it works. MIND stands for the Mediterranean-Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. That sounds like a thrilling diet, doesn't it? But it is. It's similar to two other healthy meal plans. The DASH diet, which we talked about, helps lower uh, hypertension, and the Mediterranean diet. The MIND diet approach specifically includes foods and nutrients that medical literature and data show to be good for the brain, such as berries. Raspberries with a little drizzle of chocolate syrup is almost as good as a brownie. Trust me, when I was losing all that weight, that was a really good go-to dessert. And it's it's pretty healthy because you only need just like a teaspoon of chocolate syrup. Green leafy vegetables like spinach and salad greens, at least six servings a week. My husband and I try to add a leafy green salad to all of our dinners, even when there is a vegetable side dish, which, trust me, sometimes it feels like all we're eating is greens, but it does help because part of the MIND diet, you also want to eat other vegetables at least once a day. You want to eat nuts, maybe about five servings a week, which, if you're not careful, you could do five servings all in one one sitting. Um, make sure you weigh the serving size or count the nuts because nuts can seriously add up to you. Excuse me, add up on you. You want to get one to two servings of berries a week, beans at least three servings a week, whole grains, three or more servings a day, oh, fish once a week. That's my, my weak spot right there. I have to take the fish oil tablets because I've tried all kinds of fish prepared in all kinds of ways and I just really can't do it. Poultry, like chicken or turkey, a couple times a week is good. The, the white meat is better. Olive oil, which we use as our main cooking oil, that's what's recommended. It says wine one glass a day. 
Um, I don't do wine like I mentioned earlier in the episode. It gives me really bad heartburn, so I skipped that. But for those of you that like wine, there you go. One, one, one glass a day. You want to eat less than four servings of red meat, and you really want to make sure it's a lean meat. Uh, flank steak or skirt steak, same thing, depending on which part of the country you're in. Uh, filet mignon. It's a restaurant here in town that makes really great filet mignon burgers. Um, they're just so big that I have to split it in half and share it with somebody, which doesn't usually happen. Uh, you want to use a little less than a tablespoon of butter a week, excuse me, a day, which shouldn't be too hard because if you've got really good bread, you could dip a little bit of that in olive oil and vinegar or just eat it plain. That's what I do. You want to have less than a serving a week of cheese. That's kind of also one of my weaknesses. I'm not a huge cheese person, but when I make a cold cut sandwich, I do put a slice of reduced fat cheese. Reduced fat cheese is made with 2% milk. It doesn't have a ton of chemicals and stuff in it. And pastries and sweets, less than five servings a week, which is actually a little easier than cheese at one serving a week. So you gotta, you gotta find that balance. Definitely, it says fried food, less than one serving a week. You know, they've got air fryers now, which are fantastic. I have an air fry oven, which is wonderful. So you really don't need to be drenching your food in all kinds of oil. So it's the MIND diet. Studies show people who stuck to the MIND diet lowered their risk of Alzheimer's disease by 54%. That's a huge number, especially for somebody like me who has a uh, family history of the disease. Even more importantly, researchers have found that adults who followed the diet only part of the time still cut the risk of the disease by about 35%. So if you do the 80-20 rule, you know, 80% of what you eat is the healthy, the mind diet, and 20% is the cheese, the sweets, and the pastries, and maybe some extra wine, you're probably going to be doing okay. Of course, you know, as usual, they have to do more research on the mind approach and everything else that comes with this disease, but it's definitely a promising start, and I can guarantee you, changing your nutrition to something like this, like we said earlier in the episode, don't try to do it all at once because you'll just make yourself crazy and you'll binge eat all kinds of terrible things. It really does make you feel better. Once you've retrained your mind and retrained your taste buds, and learned that, you know, a nice, rich, rustic, homemade rye bread or less sugary desserts are just as good as the other stuff, you really won't want to go back because it will not make you feel good. I guarantee it. I've been there. If you've ever had a food hangover, you'll know what I'm talking about. So, I hope you enjoyed this talk on nutrition. I hope it doesn't turn you off to trying new and better foods and maybe a better way of eating. And I cannot emphasize enough, do not try to make changes all at once. Make one change this week, one more change next week, maybe get brave, make two changes in the third week. And you know, eventually you'll be eating clean and healthy and you won't even want to go back. So, Thank you for listening. As always, please rate and review us on Apple iTunes or Google Play. Rates and reviews are the way new people find us, and we definitely want to spread all the information we can so everybody can have the best chances they have against this disease. And I will talk to you again next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye.